Hi, I'm Catherine Reed Day, and next on the St. Paul Forum, I'm talking with John Capecci about his book, Living Proof. That's next on the St. Paul Forum. Welcome to the St. Paul Forum. I'm Catherine Reed Day, and joining me today is John Capecci, one of the authors of the book Living Proof, Telling Your Story to Make a Difference. Welcome, John. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you for having us. Yes, we're really happy you could join us. Mm -hmm. So I discovered that you had written this book because there was just a little tiny <laughs> article in the St. Paul Pioneer Press that you had won an award for your book, right. or at least been not your aunt being honored, and mm -hmm. it is for remarkable book of merit, which is fantastic. <laughs> so it caught my attention. I had somehow missed that you were writing about this, even though we share a passion for story. So sure. tell us a little bit about where you've come from and where this idea for the book came from. Okay, great. Well, uh, I'm a communication trainer and consultant and writer. I, I live and work in the Twin Cities and have been here for about 20 years or so. And uh, Living Proof is based on the training work that I've been doing with my colleague, Tim Cage. Uh, he's based in New York. I'm here in, in Minneapolis. And uh, what we've been doing over the years, in addition to a, a wide range of communication training, but we've been doing more and more work with people who are telling their personal stories as advocates or spokespersons for a, a cause or an organization. And so uh, what we based the book on was that training work that takes people through that process. And this idea that telling your personal story as a way to, to get their attention, get people to buy in, essentially, mm -hmm. how long have you been focusing on that idea? How long has that been on your mind? You know, it's story, well, I should back up and tell you a little bit about, about our story. Tim and I met as graduate students. Uh, we were in a communication studies program at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and we met in a course about the power of performing stories. So uh, the work with narrative and work with the power of story has always been a part of not only our education, but what we bring to, what we think we bring to communication uh, training. But over the past probably 20 years or so, um, an interesting thing w was happening, we thought, that we were getting more and more requests from uh, clients to say what we really need help on is our stories. Um, w because we work with, with people who are getting ready to speak in a lot of different situations, um, but more and more we were getting calls for, we have someone who we need to have on camera or appear at the next event, and they really need some help on telling, telling their stories. So there, the requests became more, and but also we found that we were incorporating into our training more of that education that we had mm -hmm. uh, that was based in narrative. And so you've been working together on this for many years, really, mm -hmm. so you'd already accumulated some ideas. But mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about why, uh, why does it make a difference when there's a story associated with a cause? What is it that, I mean, we may understand it completely practically, but yeah. we also know when it's not there. Um, I mean, you're not sold. So how did you, how did you help people think through that process? Well, I think, um, a, a, as you know, when there is, we're in the presence of story, something changes. When we go beyond the bullet points, beyond brochure speak, when uh, we're presented with, and, and, and very often we are talking about mission-driven or cause-related organizations, right, where they're showing here's the need, here's how we satisfy the need, and logically we could understand that. Mm -hmm. But it's often not until we hear the story of an individual that makes a connection with us, not only that it moves us, perhaps emotionally, but that we make the connection and say, is, is that something I've seen? Is that something I can relate to in my life? Or how different that is from my experience and it suddenly opens up uh, a new way for us to look at something. Mm -hmm. And I think just the very fact that stories draw on the more imaginative, emotional parts of our brains, that it suddenly uh, the abstract is made concrete. Mm -hmm. those, those numbers suddenly 
have a face, I mean, which is the cliche we often hear, it's put a face on it. You know, I was at a speech recently, and the person I know was coming from a standpoint where she just wanted to make her case, right. and she used a ton of data, none of which I could remember when I walked <laughs> away. And it reminded me of Daniel Pink's book, and there's a little section about the World Bank, where they were trying to get a, a group of passionate advocates for work at the World Bank, and they kept using data, and it wasn't until they drilled down into the story that suddenly they lit you know, a whole f yeah. group of people on fire to get going. Yeah. So how, uh, do you find that people are skeptical about the use of story? Uh, it depends on how they approach story. I mean, I think uh, very often we, it's, it's easy to fall into this trap uh, uh, that story is magic, that it's just a matter of insert story here. And unfortunately, I think we see organizations and causes sometimes doing that, mm -hmm. is that let's just put the story out there and everyone will believe. Uh, I think that's peop when people become skeptical of stories. Like, okay. don't just tell me another story. <laughs> yeah. Link it to a message. Mm -hmm. What are you trying to show me with this story? Um, and I think that's when people suddenly sit up and, rea and, and start listening to the story in a, in a different way. Does that make, does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, I yeah. think it really does. It helps yeah. that it, it does distinguish the difference because I think uh, we are very skeptical about, the, you know, story seems to be everywhere right now. What do you... I'm just curious too, yeah. why do you think that is, that there's so much attention to it? Is it, is it that it's working? I mean, it, you and I may hope, hope that that's true, but yeah. why, why the attention now? I would love to see the study by someone who is much more qualified than I to look at it over time and to say story is important now. Story has always it's been important, right? It's always been important, yeah. But what is it that makes it trend? I mean, I think it's a, mm -hmm. great, a great question. Is what is it culturally that's going on? Uh, I mean, you know, Tim and I have been talking over the past year as we've met more organizations, more individuals who are saying, help us with story, helping with story, that, and this is purely anecdotal, but we get this sense that people are almost hungry right now for a personal connection through story. Now, w whether that's because we are fed this constant diet uh, of mediated stories, that our stories as entertainment or reality TV, mm -hmm. where people are, are, are often have to, to work to figure out the, the real truth or the, make the personal connection, mm -hmm. that sometimes that's what we're finding is that people are just, can we strip it right down to, how do I sit across from someone and tell an authentic story and have that make the connection that way? Um, so I don't know if that's part of what's going on. I do think, uh, going back to your original comment, is that People are finding that story works. Story makes money. Mm -hmm. Story. Story makes money. Okay, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the late night, well, not through the '90s into the early aughts, what we called branding, mm -hmm. right, is really about companies, organizations finding that the more coherent their stories were, the more vibrant they were, the more people that would come to them. Mm -hmm. The story of Apple, the story of Starbucks. Right. <laughs> Right. That we could hook something together and that, that narrative made sense to us, so we wanted to be part of it, essentially. Right. Right. So yeah. you've chosen to focus on advocacy, which yeah. makes me very happy, where this is, you know, the purpose of this show and others is to really help connect the dots for people about how do you, how do you connect more to your community. Mm -hmm. So when you think about ad what, what turned you to this theme of using story for advocacy, what, what happened there? Well, I think the more... We, we worked with individuals in this situation, and that, and I should be clear, these, the people we work with um, very often have made the choice. I, I have an experience, I have a lived experience, I have a story that I believe, if I share it with others, it can do some good in the world for a cause or an organization. But it, it's also people who are being approached by organizations or causes and say, could you please contribute your story? Uh, and. And it was really interesting as we work more and more with those individuals to see that it wasn't just about storytelling, mm -hmm. it wasn't just about being a good public speaker or being good on camera, that there was a lot more involved. Uh, it's, part of it is even negotiating that uh, I am now a public persona. What does it mean to go public with something that is part of your lived experience? So we became just very interested in how this was a, a combination of all of these different going back to our education, th things that we had studied and excited us, communication studies, story, um, uh, public relations, um, it all seems to come together in this simple act of, I'm going to go public with a story. So 
uh, I think the complexity of it and also the power of it mm -hmm. just really drew us both, both to it. Well, one of the things I like about the book is that you do start, well, you actually start with a great story. I do a lot of work with family businesses, and I love the very, very first little story, which is, um, is it true? Is, is it a true? Ocean Robbins story? Uh, it's a story about uh, Baskin Robbins. Oh, yes. Yeah, Ocean Robbins, yeah. Right. So, do you want to share what that little story is? Sure, and absolutely. I, you know, what, one of the things we decided in the book is that we, we follow the stories of about six or seven different advocates, some of whom we've worked with and others who we've just become familiar with. Uh, seeing them online or seeing them live tell their stories and use them as examples of the full range from you know the mom who's, whose son has severe allergies and she's asked to come in and speak to other parents mm -hmm. to people who are on the national stage like Ocean Robbins. Um, Ocean Robbins is the grandson of the man who founded Baskin and Robbins ice cream. And Ocean Robbins is an advocate for peace, he's an advocate for environmental stewardship, he's an advocate for getting youth involved in civic involvement. And the story he often tells to kick off his, his speeches is how his father, John Robbins, who was set up to uh, inherit the Baskin and Robbins fortune, uh, grew up with a ice cream cone shaped swimming pool uh, <laughs> <laughs> and all 31 flavors uh, at hand in the freezer all the time. Turned very large freezer. Very large was. freezer. Mm -hmm. Turned away from the family fortune. And his grandfather said, what are you doing? Why, mm -hmm. Are you crazy? How could you do this? And he said, you know, we live under a nuclear shadow. There are people starving all over the world. We're doing things to the environment. I don't think creating a 30-second flavor is how I want my response, what might want my response mm -hmm. to be. And it's a, just a beautiful little story mm -hmm. that, that uh, really tees up what Ocean then talks about is, is the choices we make to do to something else in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a wonderful so little So he example. uses that personal anchoring. People kind of get his, his idea, but then mm -hmm. he says, I've turned myself in a different direction. Absolutely. And so that gives him, in your opinion, that gives him a lot of credibility to do what he's doing? I think uh, one of the, I, I think absolutely. Um, and one of the, the questions we often ask advocates, what is the change? between then and now. Mm -hmm. And I think when an audience, well, what's a story basically? It's a story, something happening to someone somewhere. There is some change that occurs, right? And so we ask advocates very often, well, what's the change that occurred from where you were before to who you are now? Audiences listen for that in a story. And I think our most powerful advocates are able to say, I was blind and now I see, mm -hmm. or I thought this and now I think this. And is that part of the service that you tend to do for your clients mm -hmm. is help them make sure that they've made that transition? Absolutely. Well, to make that transition, or they're able to articulate it. There is always some, some change there, mm -hmm. uh, we believe, mm -hmm. uh, in a good advocacy story. Right. Um, and w one of the things we, we do in the book is that we focus on what we think are the five qualities of an effective advocacy story. Hold on to that for uh, just absolutely. a second. So, if you're just joining us, I'm speaking with John Capecci, the author of Living Proof. So, do you want to talk about those five points? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'll give you an example of, of one of them. Okay. Uh, and we know they're essentials because sometimes they seem so obvious. But, for example, a good and effective advocacy story is crafted, is, it has some degree of craft, and whether that is simply saying, I'm deciding to tell this and this and this and not all of this, mm -hmm. or I'm going to work with that phrase to make it more evocative or, or stick in people's heads, or I'm going to spend a moment to really describe in uh, really evocative ways what that felt like, or what that seemed. There is some craft there. And again, that seems obvious, but when we're working with people who are telling their personal stories, sometimes there's a little bit of pushback. It's like, well, it's my story. Mm -hmm. I don't want to turn it into yeah, something I don't else. Yeah, I don't want to make it something else. Exactly. There were a couple of points I thought were very helpful in the book, and one was what we were just talking about, which is this, this that they have to have turned it through the transformation. You gave an example of someone who, uh, you know, was had a personal tragedy, mm -hmm. accepted the interview with the reporter, but it ended up just being a, they completely lost the message because they had not yet turned that corner from right. their own grief to what is my cause and how am I connected to it. Mm -hmm. So that, that part seemed very important to me. And then um, 
it, it was also this uh, the, the architecture, this connecting the dots, that the story isn't isn't just the story. The story is for this action, and right. you explained that well with Ocean Robbins too. Right. That he's obviously he's got multiple actions, but yeah. what he's actually a asking people to do is is take action. So yeah. let's talk for a minute about some of the pragmatics about. Um, what makes for, well, this personal experiences that you talked about too, where someone has gone through that change, they were one way and they changed their mind and now they've become another. Um, it seems like there were a lot of examples that, where that's really what's happened. The advocacy that's going to occur is, I didn't either expect this to be part of my life yeah. or I've had an experience that's changed me in the direction. And I want to talk about it because we're all struggling to find ways to talk with each other in what we're constantly being reminded is a polarized environment. Mm -hmm. How can this technique be helpful to us in that? That's a, a great question, and you're actually, you've, you've hit on two of the other qualities that we think are essential to the use of story in this context, and I think this is a very specific context. Uh, there are times, you know, we tell our stories to, to confront ourselves, to deal, to process, or to heal. Um, but when we tell a story within the context of advocacy, one of, the, one of the essentials we feel is that it has to be positively charged. It has to point to that positive goal mm -hmm. that we're aiming toward. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean we sugarcoat it. That doesn't mean we don't say, uh, talk about what, wh what perhaps was a very dramatic or traumatic uh, moment in the story, but it always signals a positive change. So I have been through this in order that, that others do not go through it, or others can learn what I've learned, or others can be as successful as I have. There always points to that positive change. And okay. I think that's, within this context, I think is very important. And it seems to me, too, that there are some good examples of where they've taken that change, that experience, and said, so I now stand for this. Yes. Um, and what I was thinking of, uh, some good example. It seems as though there was a very pervasive campaign that used this technique during the last election, at least one or two. And in mm -hmm. Minnesota, it seems as though the Vote No campaign uh, used that technique. Were they trained by you, or is it just <laughs> no. a, a great example? No, but I was so excited to watch that campaign develop. I Give do us think an example of, yeah. of what you saw. Well, I think every, every campaign cycle we see uh, causes campaigns, uh, politicians putting a face Right? And so the stories come, become, come trotted out. I think sometimes successfully, sometimes not so successfully. What I thought was really interesting about Minnesotans United for All Families and Project 515 and those who were, were putting stories out front, it was not simply to put a face on a campaign, it was to have the conversations. Mm -hmm. And that was the phrase they used. And so I think wor where their power in that campaign was is that they focused not on just insert story here, but it was open the conversation. Stories aren't magic, stories open conversations. Excellent. And I think that's, mm -hmm. I think that's the power of that, what mm -hmm. happened there. So uh, let's talk a little bit about why is advocacy so important to us today? What, you know, we're, we've got tons of issues on the table, a lot of nonprofits uh, vying for our attention. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what is it about shaping this advocacy that you see is important? Well. Uh, you, you're right. You know, I, I saw a statistic, I think we mentioned it in the book, that last time we looked, the estimate was something like 1.5 million nonprofits just in the U.S. When you think about how many of them are relying on people telling their stories to support their mission, it is, it is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it is, always, it is always going to be important for us to make the personal connection with a cause or, or with an organization. Why we think it's important now is that we do see where it's being used really well and it's being done well and where it's perhaps not working as well. I do think we can become numb to story mm -hmm. uh, when it's not, when we don't look at some of the, the whole context, that it's not intentional, that it's not, I hate to use the word authentic, mm -hmm. <laughs> but we do judge. Right. But we do know when it's not convincing. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I was at an event which I was totally predisposed to support. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will say that there wasn't a single example or story used effectively. And I walked out and didn't write the check, you know. I mean, That's I it. totally knew I was supposed to write that check, yeah. and I, I support that organization. Mm -hmm. But um, it did not happen because 
I thought, you've taken my time and you didn't deliver something exactly. to me exactly. that I expected to have delivered. And so I wonder how, uh, obviously, I should send him a copy of the book. Would you please? <laughs> <laughs> but can you uh, point, I, know, I like the fact that the book has a lot of practical aspects mm -hmm. to it. This is something you can do at home. <laughs> it works well if you have help. But the purpose, I think, was for, to get people to do this at home. Can you talk a little bit about how you structured the, the task so sure. that others who want to be better advocates, it's timely because people are up at the Capitol telling their story, you know, right. uh, this is the season of making the case. Yeah. Um, talk about a couple yeah. of the different parts of it. Sure. Uh, one of the things we, we decided early on was that this had to be an accessible and practical and usable guide. Um, and that's part of the impetus for writing it. When we would conduct trainings with organizations or individuals, very often they'd ask for what additional resources. And we could only point them to books about story, books about communication, books about, but nothing that everything pulled it all together. And the last thing you want to do is hand people a bibliography and say, maybe this will help next week. <laughs> <laughs> so what we tried to do was, was really boil it down to the essentials. We don't get into a lot of the theory and academics behind it, but it's certainly grounded in, in, in those works. And we made it very workbooky. Uh, we were really happy when we saw some readers last year show us their books that had yellow you know, post-it notes all over it and they were writing all over the, the margins. We really tried to make it a workbook. And we also wrote in very short and digestible sections so that if you're getting ready for an interview next week or for a, a presentation or a talk, Next week, you can flip to those sections. What do I need to know about uh, doing a local interview, mm -hmm. a television interview, or a phone interview? Uh, if I've already been telling my story and I just need to fine tune it, or I want to refresh it or figure out how better to get it into 20 seconds, you can flip to that section as well. So um, you can dive down as deeply as you'd like, I think, w with the book is what we aim for, but also you can grab and go mm -hmm. and use some um, quick suggestions. What kind of successes are you hearing about? Uh, can you give us an example yeah. of someone who's, who became a better story deliverer and got a result? Our dear friend, uh, Renee, who wrote all over the margins, she's the person I was just thinking of when I was talking about, when she said, look at my book, I read your book, has been writing for five years now in the, multi in the MS, um, Ride for Life, I think it is called, mm -hmm. and uh, for her in, in in honor of her daughter who has multiple sclerosis. And so this is the fourth year she's writ she's uh, been in the in the race. Each year she goes out and tells her story to her friends and her families to say, please support me in this. But she felt it was stale. I said, I'm going to go back to them with the same story. And she used the book and she said, I found a different way to look at it. She raised more money than she ever had, which was wonderful. She had more people sign up to support her in the race. So that was a great. Example. Yeah. So you have multiples of those, I assume. Then. Yeah. But so so some something about the way, and she did it herself, is what you're she saying. Did she it used her the book herself, yeah. and recrafted, reconnected those dots. Because okay. that's one of the things I thought was very interesting was that it's it's not just the story. You you give examples where the story is is the spine, mm -hmm. and then you had a couple of different departure points that connect the dots to the cause. Right. Uh, but you had multiple ways to embed the story, if, if you will, yeah. uh, to help people understand. Um, do you have examples where people try each of the different ones, and, and uh, or do you know if they try different approaches to it? I don't know, but that is one area that people very often, how do I organize this? Um, do I just start from the beginning of the story and then end the story and leave? Uh, it really depends on the context. You might be you might be also responsible for delivering some key messages for an organization. So how do I weave those in there as well? Mm -hmm. uh, we give some, also some tried and true uh, models for how to structure a good persuasive presentation, for example, and perhaps that's the model. We really try to give it a, an, as many options as yeah, possible because there is no one recipe. Yeah, I mean. Exactly. So how did you come up with the, uh, the title, Living Proof? I like, I like that title oh, a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. I, I, I don't remember. I just remember we had about 20, 25 different titles and called on all of our friends and family. Said, what's going to stick here? What's going to stick? Mm -hmm. um, we had to think, too, about what shows up in searches. And mm -hmm. we wanted to make sure get get telling your story in there. Yeah, I like that, but I think this idea of living proof mm -hmm. is, it, it, what you're really saying is you're going to embody what you believe in. Right. And it seems as though the techniques you use are designed for that. How do people get a hold of you and how will they get a copy of the book now that they're ready to be better 
convincers. <laughs> so, well, you can read a copy, uh, read a sample of the book uh, if you go to our website, which is Living Proof Advocacy, livingproofadvocacy.com, and you can read a sample of the book there. It's available in all our usual online uh, big book retailers. Tim and I, as independent authors and publishers, are, are really urging people to support their local booksellers. Good. So if you go to our website, you can see locally where the book is being sold by independents, but also there's a link to IndieBound where you can see what other independent booksellers all around the country are, show, are selling it online or in their stores as well. And how, do you know how many copies you've sold so far? Is that a loaded question? Is, it, is it going the I, way you wanted it to? It's going, it's going very well. We, we went into a second printing by the end oh, of last year. That's we, great. We, I, we're, we're and this is self-published. And is, as yeah. we started, uh, and of course, self-publishing has changed dramatically. And yeah. it's, it's what more and more people are doing. So the fact mm -hmm. that you were also recognized for, for what you're doing is great. We, as we've been saying to everyone when we got the news of the Kirkus reviews, uh, uh, that we were on the best of 2012 list as we did not see that coming. That was it was a wonderful way to end. So it'll end help the you year. promote it and get it. I would think it'll give That's you an it. excuse for another round of of local reads. And, Absolutely. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I really wish that more people would use it because uh, I think there's so many. We're about to enter that season of all the mm -hmm. breakfasts for all the nonprofits. So right, they right. could use your guide to uh, shape yeah. the testimonials that will be uh, sure. presented at those breakfasts. One thing we real have been very excited about is that um, it's been picked up by a number of college and university courses really? as an auxiliary text. So Really? Yeah. And what do you make of that? So college, uh, college communications programs? It's been public speaking classes. It's been classes in story and narrative, poli-sci. It's being used in a poli-sci course at That's Rutgers. Fabulous. Yeah, and, and we're also being introduced to uh, academic programs that are focusing on this very thing. Social justice programs where they're looking for advocacy tools and how to help people who are going to be going, to be going out and making a difference in the world to give mm -hmm. them some, some resources. So we've been delighted to be that's in contact great. with those so, folks. Yeah. Um, that's great. So that's quite a compliment, I think, too. So, well, we're delighted that you could join us today and tell us a little bit more about Living Proof. That's all we have time for. Join us again next week on the St. Paul Forum.